Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture 5 and in this segment we're actually going to start talking about the Coriolis force. This is mostly going to be a conceptual overview, there will be a little bit of math but the next segments that follow will be a little bit more math heavy as we actually start to quantify the Coriolis force. But the primary emphasis of this particular segment will be more of a conceptual overview. So with that, we'll go ahead and dive into it. So just to sort of uh, just sort of reiterate a couple points and a couple key points that are important to keep in mind is when we're thinking about the centripetal and centrifugal force that we defined in the last lecture, we're talking about an object that is situated at the same Earth relative location. And that sequence of words might seem kind of confusing. What the heck does that actually mean? And again, I'll sort of break the fourth wall here and point out that you watching this video you are not moving at all. You are in a chair, in a nice stationary, a stationary point, and by Earth relative location, we basically mean what your latitude, longitude, and height above the ground are. If you are not moving, then you are at the same latitude, longitude, and height. Even as the Earth's rotating, you are still at the exact same latitude, longitude, and height. You are not changing latitude, you're not changing longitude, you're not changing your height if you are perfectly stationary watching this video. So that's what we mean by same Earth relative location. That means the latitude and the longitude and the height above the ground do not change at all. However, if an object is in motion, if you were to get up from this video and start walking around, then you would be changing your Earth relative location, or in other words, you would be changing either your latitude, your longitude, or if you were to jump straight into the air, then you would be changing your height above the ground, so you would not be in the same Earth relative location. And in fact, when an object is in motion, that's when we have to start work when an object is in motion relative to a rotating reference frame. So again, Earth is a rotating non-inertial reference frame. If an object is moving on the Earth, meaning it's changing latitude, changing longitude, or changing height, then we have to start accounting for the Coriolis force. We can't just think about the centripetal centrifugal force, then we have to start accounting for the Coriolis force. So again, that sort of just summarizes the point that I just made. If you are in fact moving, whether that's, that can be any direction, north, south, east, west, up, or down, you are not in the same Earth relative location, meaning now you have to start accounting for the Coriolis force. Although, we'll sort of emphasize this later on as well, just the act of you walking, technically there is a Coriolis force acting on you, but it's extremely small. You wouldn't be able to tell what direction or the force is actually acting because it's just really small, but we'll talk more about that later on. So, just to sort of get a mathematical bearing on what exactly is going on here, if you have an object that's at rest, again, same Earth relative position, or in other words, it's staying at the same latitude, longitude, and height above the ground at all points in time, then we showed this when we did the centrifugal, the centrifugal force derivation where the, ob the only velocity that you have to account for is just the velocity of the body that you're on. So here you only have to account for the fact that the Earth is rotating, so that would just be the angular velocity of the Earth omega times your distance from the Earth's rotational axis r or the radius in this uh, radius of curvature as it might be. However, if you're an object in motion, now you have to account for the fact that you are moving. So you have to account for the fact that the Earth is rotating, which is again the same term here, and then you also have to account for your own velocity relative to Earth, and that's represented by this term u here. So this is the Earth's rotation, and this is your motion on the Earth. So if again, if u is non-zero, that means, and this is not to be confused with zonal wind, this is the same sim symbology that I'm using for a centripetal and centrifugal force. So V is not meridional wind, U is not zonal wind. I just want to make sure there's no confusion on that. V is the total velocity that, you're exp that you have. So that's accounting for Earth's rotational velocity and your own velocity relative to Earth. So U would be non-zero. This term U would be non-zero if you were up walking around or maybe you're in your car. You're moving, you're changing your latitude, longitude, and or your vertical uh, your vertical height above the ground, that's where this term u comes into play. So if we consider again the magnitude of centripetal or centrifugal acceleration, minus v squared over r, if we take this top expression up here, v equals omega r, and plug that in, we basically get the same result that we had previously. We get that the centripetal acceleration or the centrifugal force is just minus omega squared r, which is the same result we got in the previous segment. Now things get a little bit more interesting when we plug in this expression for V, which now accounts for the fact that we are moving relative to Earth, meaning we're changing latitude, longitude, or vertical height above the ground. So if we take this expression for V and plug it into this equation up here, minus V squared over R, 
we get a result that looks like this, and then we can expand that out, since that is a nice polynomial. We can expand that out, then cancel out some factors of r, and we get an expression that looks like this. So this is the same centrifugal force that we had to begin with. So that's still the same. We pick up this, we'd pick up two more terms though when we add this factor of u in here. So we get this minus two omega u. That is in fact the magnitude of the Coriolis force and we'll explore that in greater detail later on. But for now, you can sort of think of that as the magnitude of the Coriolis force. And this term over here at the end, u squared over r, you can sort of think of that as your motion's contribution to the centrifugal force. But when you think about the values of u, so u might be 10 meters per second, maybe if you're going in an all-out sprint, uh, something on the order of 10 meters per second, or if you're in a car, maybe 20, 30 meters per second. And this r here is basically a factor of the Earth's, velo of the, uh, Earth's radius. So this is going to be an extremely small term. It's not zero, but usually it's something that is so small that we can completely ignore it. So the main two things that we want to focus on here is the magnitude of our centrifugal force due to the Earth's rotation, and again, the Coriolis term, which we pick up here by including this factor of u and v. Sorry about that. By including this factor of u and v, we pick up this Coriolis term and also your contribution, your uh, relative motion contribution to the centrifugal force. Again, this is also sort of a centrifugal force term, but usually we can just ignore that because it's really small. Now, there are uh, there are a few differences between centripetal and centrifugal force, but there's also quite a few similarities. Just like centripetal and centrifugal force, that we showed in the previous lecture, the force that you experience is proportional to the latitude that you're at. Coriolis force is also the same way. The Coriolis force depends on latitude, and again, we'll show that in greater detail later on. Also, just like centripetal and centrifugal force, Coriolis force only changes the direction of motion. It does not change the speed. So centripetal centrifugal force only changes your direction of motion. Coriolis force does the same thing. It does not change the speed at which you're traveling. And also, just like centrifugal force, the strength of the Coriolis force depends on the wind speed itself. So the Coriolis deflection that you experience is going to be, if, if you're traveling really fast and you're going to have a stronger deflection from the Coriolis force. And similarly, it, the, the dependency is a little bit different because in a centripetal and centrifugal force, you have you have a force that's dependent on the square of the velocity. But in the case of the Coriolis force, it's only dependent on the velocity. It's a nice linear relationship. And again, we'll talk about that in a later segment when we actually get more into the mathematics of this. But this is more of just a conceptual overview. So again, just to sort of highlight that point, if we take the equation that we have, and I've dimmed the other terms out so we can focus on this Coriolis term, you can see that the magnitude of the Coriolis force does in fact depend on your, on your Earth relative motion. So if you're running really fast, you'll have a stronger Coriolis force, you still won't feel it, but you will have a stronger Coriolis force versus if you're walking really slowly, you'll still have a Coriolis force, but it won't be as strong. And this is something that's very, very important to keep in mind. The Coriolis force is only significant at large scales of time and space. Now, there's a, I'm going to tie this back to a really common myth that sometimes gets floated around there. There's this idea of how in the northern hemisphere, when you go to flush a toilet, the water spins in one direction, and in the southern hemisphere, the water spins in the other direction. That actually is not true at all. The, the, the idea behind that is the idea behind that is due to the Coriolis force. Somehow the Coriolis force is responsible for the toilet bowl rotating its water in different directions, but that's actually not true at all. Coriolis force is way too weak on the scale of a toilet bowl to actually cause the toilet water to, to rotate in opposite directions. The reason why the water might rotate in opposite directions is solely due to the, the way that the jets in the, in the water and the toilet bowl are oriented. It has nothing to do with the Coriolis force. Coriolis force is only significant in large scales of time and space, which usually, which means we're usually only concerned with it on large scale weather patterns like large scale uh, lows, highs, troughs, ridges, but we'll get more into the details of that later on as, as it becomes necessary. But main thing is Coriolis force only significant at large scales of time and space. And another example I like to tie, uh, tie back to to sort of hammer down this point, I kind of mentioned it earlier, you wouldn't be able to tell me what direction the Coriolis force is, what direction the Coriolis force is pushing you if you're out walking because it's just way too weak for you to experience. So 
hopefully uh hopefully i don't hopefully i don't don't sound too much like a broken record but coriolis force only really important if we're at a large scale of time or space another property of the coriolis force which again will substantiate with uh, more of a mathematical derivation later on in the northern hemisphere the coriolis force acts primarily acts to the right of an object's velocity vector so in this case i have a velocity vector that's pointing due north that would mean the Coriolis force would be acting to the east. It's going to try and take this object, whatever it might be, and it's going to try and steer it to the east. In the southern hemisphere, it's reversed. So in the southern hemisphere, the Coriolis force acts to the left of an object's velocity vector. So if I'm traveling due north in the southern hemisphere, the Coriolis force will in fact want to deflect that object to the west. And at the equator, the Coriolis force is essentially zero. When we look at the mathematics behind this, we will see this is not actually the case all the time. It is possible to get a Coriolis deflection at the equator, but most most of the time we can just completely ignore that because the Coriolis force is essential. Most of the time, the Coriolis force is zero at the equator, and we don't need to worry about it. There are some exceptions to that rule, but usually we don't need to worry about those. So that's going to do it for this segment. Just sort of a primarily a conceptual overview of the Coriolis force. And in the next segment, we will take a look at more of the mathematics behind the Coriolis force. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.